welcome to Real. I'm Damo. I'm Anthony. Tonight on Real, we are looking at how athletes survive the physical demands of their profession and what music lovers and Melbourne's live music scene are doing to ensure its survival. So, Anthony, what do you think of when I say the word endurance? I think about, like, Steve Monaghetti. I think about Tour de France. But the number one endurance athlete, for me, has got to be Bethany Hamilton. Bethany Hamilton? You don't know who Bethany Hamilton is? Doesn't ring a bell. I keep telling you, mate, read a fucking book. <laughs> Bethany Hamilton is awesome. She's an absolute legend. When she was, uh, when she was 13 years old, a 15-foot tiger shark took her arm off like from the shoulder. And wow. she is still getting out there and winning titles. In 2008, I think she won the juniors. And she actually still surfs and actually goes in the water after a shark ate her arm. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. But not everyone views endurance the way we do, and they should. So we sent Kirby and Jono out to the field to do a few Vox Pops to see what you people think. Let's see what they found. Word Association Marathon. So it's all about uh, how long the body can uh, endure pain, I guess, without uh, its sustenance or um, being relieved of uh, or using it more energy, I guess, in the context of what you're talking about. Surviving any struggle, no matter the odds, no matter what happens, keep getting up. Yeah. And be number one. Get, don't let anything get you down, just keep going. That's right. Uh, ranging from what you see on TV with regards to athletes all the way through to uh, people living in much harsher economic or social conditions than we do and how they pull through. I guess the struggle for humans to survive day in and day out and maybe progress as a species, uh, move forward in life, overcome the schools that we face. Probably athletic endurance comes to mind uh, first up. Um, people like long distance runners and um, triathletes, things like that. Well, wow. looks like everybody thinks the same way that we do, which is kind of really sad for the country. But I mean that when they think of endurance, they go automatically go to sport. Yeah, yeah, just physical endurance. That's what everyone thinks about. Mm. Okay, excited for this next segment, Anthony. Totally am. I'm calling it Anthony's mailbag because here I'm at, not calling it that. Here at Real, we've received a lot of emails. It's a bit funny. It's very, it's very interesting that we're getting a lot of emails and letters, things as we didn't ask for any. So, they're here now, and you've gone to the effort, and we're going to answer them. I didn't even know we had an email address, but I didn't anyway, even know how to send a letter. You've offered to answer these questions, so let's, let's do it. Let's test this trivia. Let's go. Bring Sam it on. has emailed in. Sammy. What do you got for me, Sammy? <laughs> Would like to know, what is the Sydney to Hobart yacht race, and how does endurance come into it? It's a yacht race that goes from Sydney to Hobart. Uh, endurance was endurance because it's a really long, long race <laughs> and people sometimes die on the way to Hobart. It's true, true story. That's, that's serious. Okay, this one's from the girls in the studio. They've emailed in. Why? You're standing right there. <laughs> Their question is, which sex won the only gold medal in the pool at the London Games and in what event? Boom. Anthony, easy, way too easy. Ladies, 4x100 freestyle relay on the first night. Big ups, made us proud, only gold medal in the pool. Boys couldn't do anything. They did jack. Jack. This one's from Tim. He has an impending sporting commitment and uh, he's heard about the beep test and how the very best athletes can clock the test. First, what is the beep test and how can you clock it, says Tim. You know more about beep tests than I do. Well, basically, what is it? it's a test. It, it's an audio test and you've given, what, 70 metres to run and... The time between beeps starts at about 60 seconds and it gets closer and closer and you just got to keep, keep running. running it's up and down the end of the test court. of endurance. I think it's a drinking game as well, isn't it? It totally it? is a drinking game. You just replace the running with the drinking. So every time you hear a beep, take a drink. That's all our mailbag for tonight. We're going to a break now and uh, when we come back, we'll be interviewing Miss Sian Bowman about how ordinary people endure day-to-day -day life and how living with illness and disability raises human mentality to a new level. See you soon. Welcome back. We're now moving on to a more serious note of human endurance and the different stages that we can endure at. For a long time, people around the world have coped with stress and work overload, but somehow managed to continue with everyday life. Is this instinct or something humans have just learned to deal with? Well, now I'm joined with 
Ms. Sian Bowman, a lecturer at La Trobe University with work covering a broad range of human persistent topics from youth mental health to therapy for adolescents with mental health problems. Welcome, Sian. Thank you. We're going to be talking about psychosis, which is um, triggered by stress mainly. Um, what got you interested in psychosis to begin with? As a student, I, I found psychiatry really amazing and interesting and the, the people who I worked with on placement who had mental health problems were very inspiring people who had endured a great, much in, a great many things in their life. And I thought it was a really amazing area of health to be interested in. It was fascinating. Not a lot was known about it. Um, and you could do a lot of great work. So typically for a young person, how is psychosis triggered? It's really in the story. Everyone has a different story. And ultimately, we all have a bucket. You know, we can all manage a certain amount of stress in the bucket. Once it gets too much, the bucket will overflow. Sure. can manifest itself in a lot of different ways, but it's ultimately about how much someone can manage and cope with and cope effectively with. Sure. How many Australians would be uh, living with different forms of psychosis? In the age group of 15 to 25, one in four young people have a mental illness. Um, psychotic disorders is the least common, so it's about 3% of that population. Depression and anxiety are the most common mental health disorders in that population. Sure. Is there enough support out there for, for people and young people in particular with psychosis? I think it's really hard for a young person to recognise that they're having a psychosis. I think it's hard for family. Um, parents look at their child and think, is this just normal adolescent behaviour? The transition from you know, school to uni is quite difficult and that's usually when these things happen. It's hard to get help. There's lots of evidence that says young people aren't going to rock up to the GP and say, oh, I'm paranoid and I think people are talking to me or I'm scared to go out because I think someone might hurt me or um, parents don't really know how to articulate it. So it's hard to get help. Then once you get help, the treatment isn't very nice. What are the signs you'd look for in friends and, and if, you, if you think there's something wrong, what can you do? Usually the first thing that you notice is that their behaviour changes. So I know that in the social group of young people it's very common to go out and drink and take recreational drugs and sometimes friends might notice that their friends just pushing it just a bit more than everyone else and it's a bit unusual for them. Um, and then they might start to withdraw a bit and stay home more and not talk, not, not be as open about what's going on in their head. Um, big kind of heroic actions aren't accepted very easily because people are, young people who are going through it are quite suspicious. So you have to tread really gently, um, but be supportive. The evidence is if you are supportive and, and you maintain connections with your friends and your family, then you're gonna get over it quicker. So it leads to a much better prognosis. Well, thanks for having a chat with us, Sian. I'm sure the viewers at home are left with something to think about. And if you or someone you know needs support, please call the number on your screen. Now, Melbourne has a rich music history with some of Australia's greatest bands playing in venues around the city before making it big. Declan and Connor are two young musicians hoping to do the same. Tonight, they're here in the real studio for a special performance. Take it away, guys. Awake, oh, oh, I really need to know. Are you getting back with him? Are you letting him go? Are you letting him go? Are you letting him go? Because I've been waiting two years to tell you what. But there was always something between me and you But there was always something between me and you But there was always something Oh, yeah Oh, and I Yes, I need your loving girl. 
thing I've ever had to do in my life To keep all those feelings on the inside Now he's gone and you don't wanna know him And now he's gone, so you should start to know me, girl Now he's gone and you don't wanna know him And now he's gone and you don't wanna know him And now he's gone and you should start to know me, girl Are you getting back with him? Are you letting him go? Letting him go, letting him go. Cause I've been waiting two years to tell you one thing, and I know if I should walk, talk, yell, or now sing, oh, now sing. But there was always something between me and you. But there was always something between me and you. But there was Welcome back to Real. It's great that we can do our bit to support live music in Melbourne. Now, Anthony, have Declan and Connor and even Sian made you think differently about endurance? Yeah, totally. It's not always about how far or fast you can run, but for some people, something as simple as achieving goals can be a real struggle. I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. On this whole music you know, theme that we've got going here, when's the la what's the last Australian band or solo artist that you saw live? The last time I went out of my way to watch a gig mm -hmm. was probably just a friend playing acoustic probably two or three years ago down in Hawthorne. That's the last time I actually went out of my way. Doesn't sound like you went too far out of your way. Yeah. Uh, it's funny you say that because the next documentary, Turn It Up, focuses on Melbourne's live and local music scene. With interviews from a range of musicians and venue owners, the filmmakers look at just how sustainable Melbourne's renowned music culture actually is. So let's take a look. And this is only how it is at the moment. Who knows? We're living in interesting times. We've got Spotify happening, iTunes is killing it. So basically, at the moment, I think it's just good enough to have a day job and do shows and let the shows pay for your next album. You can all be excellent at what you do, but when you all play together, sometimes it doesn't matter if you're not the best, but when you all gel together and you create that one sound, and you all, you're all looking at each other and you're like, well, that's when you realise there's something a little bit different there, something a little bit special. I think the idea of making it sort of lost its shine. Writing a masterpiece song that we all look at and go, wow, can you believe that we did this? You know, you come out of the studio and you record and go, this is what we did, this. Like, that is probably the new making it. I really want to say this, because nobody told me this when I was younger. 
If you're in a rock band, don't just listen to rock music. Um, listen to absolutely everything you can, and more importantly, go out and see it as well. Even if it's hip hop, even if it's even if it's classical music, whatever, it will benefit you. If I was to give any advice to a band starting like now, I'd say learn. The first thing you have to do is learn how to play as a band, and not not uh, be too worried if you know if you don't get your 16 bar solo in this song you know that's cool you know it's more about it's a, it's about the collective sound that you can produce and i think the, the best thing you can do is have a good time you know if you break your string if you stuff up if you drop your guitar you know who gives a shit at least you're up there go and meet the other band meet the pub owners meet the people that are doing what you want to do because it doesn't matter if you make it anywhere or don't, you're gonna have a fucking rad time doing it. Play as much as you can, but also record it, video it. Um, have some audio recording so that when you're chasing up other bands to get shows, you can send them a link and uh, show them how good you are. other guys that are willing to you know explore those kind of things and give everything a go you just it's pretty much unlimited to what you can do the hip-hop I love and the hip-hop I choose to promote and to share is predominantly 90s hip-hop from the United States, the originators, the golden era of hip hop, and that's because it's the music I enjoy and I can resonate, especially with A Tribe Called Quest when they're talking about um, roots and they're talking about um, their cultural backgrounds and when they talk about racism, that stuff resonates with me. Over the years, since I became a facilitator for workshops and working with newly arrived or all women crews, I found that DJ has again um, become a bit more important than just having that resident gig. What's important for me is using hip hop as a positive tool for young people and what I've seen is there's a, there is a scene in Australia, not just Melbourne, of Aussie hip hop that's not really positive and they're not really sharing anything of interest and they're not telling anyone any uh, information that could be useful in their day to day activity, they're just talking a lot of crap. You know, then there's some artists in Australia that have embraced hip hop and uh, they get a bit political and they get a bit educational and they get a bit, uh, they almost like storytelling and it's quite beautiful to hear and quite beautiful to watch and that's the other side. Unfortunately, the indigenous hip hop scene doesn't get supported. And I've worked with some of the most amazing indigenous artists. Um, I've been lucky enough to perform with them at indigenous festivals. They don't get put on the big festival lineups. Some may have in the past, but it's not something that's very prominent. But if we flip the script, there are so many soul singers and um, soul bands and funk bands that are just taking Melbourne by storm. And unfortunately, people aren't leaving their houses to watch them, so there's only a select few of us that know about it, right? Let's spread the word, let's support the good stuff. I'm a, a vocalist. I generally stick to the genres of hip hop and soul. I have a soul bag called The Optics, it's Candice Monique and The Optics officially, and we, um, we go through a label in the UK called Freestyle Records. It was kind of a bit of sweet because in a way it's that you would like to get that recognition at home and you would like to think that labels here in Australia would recognise the talent that we have here as much as overseas labels do, but it doesn't always happen that way, which is sad. But at the same time, it's exciting for us because then it means touring overseas possibly and, and um, you know, the music reaching you know, audiences that we might not have had access to before. There was one song that I put on the Optics album, it was called Revolution, that was kind of 
um, it was it was about how we are the ones who have the power to create change. And when you're talking about the social environment, you know, which which is where musicians work. You know, we work in everybody else's social environment. We have that opportunity then to bring ideas and messages into that environment that will create cohesion, that will create you know respect for diversity and valuing you know the people in our environment you know um and yeah so i guess that's that's something that you'll always find as an undertone in my music i, I have a lot of love for the fact that here in melbourne the hip-hop scene crosses pretty much every ethnicity that you can find in this city probably are the reasons that i moved to melbourne in the first place um you know there's a lot more venues that are willing to put on live acts Therefore, there's a lot more musicians, you know, playing on the live scene. A lot more bands happening, getting created. A lot more collaboration happening between the artists. You know, local scenes that may not have had the support from their own community previously. You know, they'll be able to put their stuff out there, and somewhere, someone out there will listen. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Deep breath. Much like our music policy here is to be really diverse. I guess we've carved out a fair niche in here around hip hop, bass and dancehall kind of music cultures as well. As well as trying to develop acts and talent and you know the scenes as well by doing you know we do like an open mic gig on a Monday night um, and try and develop young acts to then build them up to the point where you know they can do big gigs and get on other lineups when we've got touring artists or with local supports and then eventually hopefully you know when they make it big and they want to do launches and things like that then they come back to here to do that sort of stuff as well. I think Melbourne's probably got the strongest music scene in the country. Probably one of the few cities in the world where you could go out to a gig in almost any genre any night of the week. And that's great from a patron point of view. Um, and it's great from a scene point of view and things like that as well, but it can be very difficult at times from a venue's point of view to try and like keep a degree of uniqueness to your venue that's going to make people want to come to your spot rather than, you know, some other place that's got a similar thing on that night. You know? still got more licensed premises as in like bars etc per capita than any other city in the world. <laughs> I think if people actually realised and actually knew how much gold there was in their own fucking city it would be ridiculous. You people need to stop talking and stop listening to your iPods and stop watching YouTube. You need to get out of your house. I don't care that it's raining. It's not going to kill you. It's only water. You need to get out of your house and you need to go and support your artists. It's, it's gotta be something that comes from the grassroots up and you are the grassroots, so bring us up, you know. I don't know about you, Anthony, but I really hope that pubs and venues around Melbourne continue to support live music. Yeah, me too. But with music like that being produced night after night, I'm sure it's gonna thrive. Well, that's all we have time for this week. It's been real. Good night. Bye. Bye. On the next episode of Real, we ask the question, what do you think about genetic testing? Dr. Warwick Grant will share his research in molecular sciences. Children from Brunswick East Primary School tell us what makes their family different and you'll be invited into the public housing development in Richmond in the documentary, Comfortable Living.
Thank you.